So, good morning, Grade 11s. Today we're going to look at our periodic inventory system, which I introduced to you with your Smart Effects exercise. Um, hopefully it makes sense to you how you can do your calculations based on um, whatever you had bought plus what you um, had in the beginning is your total amount that was available for sale. If you then look at what's left over at the end, you can work out your cost of sales. That we refer to as the periodic inventory system. These days, it is much easier to use the perpetual inventory system than it was in the past. In the past, we didn't have computers, many years ago, obviously, with the dinosaurs. Um, we didn't have computers, and it was much harder to keep track of small value items. These days, with the advent of barcoding, it's very easy to go to the shop, and they just scan it as you buy it. And automatically, as it is scanned, the computer system records the fact that, oh, this particular item has now been sold, and it knows what the cost of that particular item was. So you can still use the perpetual inventory system. Previously, however, you would have used the perpetual system more for the higher value, low volume goods. Okay. However, there are still sometimes businesses that are smaller and maybe don't have a barcoding system. And for them, the periodic inventory system is going to be much better. So obviously, if you've got, if you're a small business and you don't have a barcoding system, but you are selling cars, for example. Well, no, then you don't need to use the periodic system. You could still use perpetual because you're only selling a few of this particular item. However, if you are a small business with many low-value goods, in that case, you are going to want to use the periodic system because you can get your goods. So, our cost of sales would then be determined periodically. In other words, every so often at set intervals. So maybe every week, every month, or usually every year. It depends on the needs of your business. You would have to calculate it every year in order to work out your cost of sales for your statement of income, but you might also want to do it more often, um, especially if you suspect that there's something funny going on if stocks are being stolen. Think of the blue smarties that I ate in your activity. To work out your um, cost of sales, you would take your opening stock plus everything that you've bought minus your closing stock to get the cost of the goods that you sold. Do you remember that? So, in our general ledger accounts, we need to have a look at how are we actually going to do this. Trading stock is what we always use for our perpetual system, and we tracked our stock on an ongoing basis, perpetually. So, continuously, we knew how much stock we were supposed to have. However, if we're using the periodic inventory system, we might know what our trading stock was at the beginning, and we might know what it is at the end, but we don't actually know what it is day to day. We will still have a trading stock asset account, but it's only going to show us the beginning and end balances, because we do need those to be able to show in our statement of financial position what is the asset inventory. What we will do is we will then transfer it out of our trading stock account to an expense account called opening stock. That then we are saying, our trading stock, we had it at the beginning of the year, but now we're assuming we're going to sell it. So we transfer it to an opening stock account, which will then make up part of the cost of sales calculation. And at the end of the year, we will create a closing stock account that in effect will reduce the value of my purchased inventory or my expense. Um, at the end of the year, and it will put into my trading stock account the value that I actually need to show in my statement of financial position. Okay, so your trading stock account you're not going to use during the year. You are only going to have it at the beginning and end of the year, and it's going to look like that. Here's my balance from last year, but that now means that's what I had at the beginning of this year, so I'm going to create an opening stock account, which is going to be an expense that I will use to calculate cost of sales. At the end of the year, I do a stock take, and I can see what is my closing stock left over, and I will put it into trading stock so that I've got an inventory in my inventory management. Purchases, then, is the account that we are going to use throughout the year. So in a way, this purchases replaces how I would have used trading stock during the year. Purchases is an expense account, and its idea is saying, I am assuming that everything that I bought is actually an expense because I'm going to sell it. 
So um, it's kind of like when you buy stationery, even if you haven't used it yet, you've reported it as an expense. We're doing the same thing here. We're saying, I'm buying my stock, but I'm assuming that I'm going to sell it, and therefore I'm going to report it as an expense immediately. And at the end of the year, I will take into account the closing stock as an asset. Okay? So we'll use it instead of trading stock during the year. If the owner takes goods for his own use, or maybe you pay out a donation to somebody else in the form of stock, you would then show those items in the purchaser's account in the same way that you would have taken it out of the trading stock account. If you return goods to your creditors, you will also take it out of the purchaser's account. Now here's something a little bit interesting. Do you remember that you can have a debtor's allowances account to offset sales where debtors return goods to you? Yes. Okay. In the same way, as we've got debtors' allowances to contrast the sales income, we can also have a creditors' allowances account to contrast our purchases' expense. We would do this if we want to keep track of the total amount that is sent back to the supplier. Maybe you want to see, hang on, maybe this particular item is actually faulty. Um, I want to see how bad my supplier is. You then can track it using a creditors' allowances account. If you record it in the creditors' allowances account during the year, obviously you would need to close that off to the purchaser's account at the end of the year, in the same way that you close debtors' allowances off to sales. That's optional. Okay. You will only use a creditors' allowances account for purchases, so not for allowances of um, anything else, so not if it's repairs or stationery, it's only for our stock purchases, and it's optional. It will only be used in the energy system if you choose. So you need to just look at the example that's given to you and see have they used it or not. Some businesses might decide to have an allowances account. Other businesses might say, no, we don't need it. We are just going to report the return straight out of the purchaser's account. Either is correct. At the end of the day, your purchasers will have the net income. At the end of the year, you will then close off your purchaser's account to the trading account. Now, if you think of your perpetual system, do you remember that as things were sold during the year, you would take it out of trading stock and put it into cost of sales expense account? Okay. We don't have a cost of sales expense because we're assuming that all my purchases are expenses. So in a sense, that is my cost of sales, except that I need to combine it with opening stock and closing stock. Okay. I will do all of that in the trading account. Do you remember the cost of sales was closed off to the trading account? Together with sales, we're going to take purchases to the trading account. Out of interest, it is also possible to say, you don't like this lump of strange things going into trading account. Let's tidy it up a bit. Let's take opening stock, purchases, and closing stock and put it into a cost of sales account first, and then from cost of sales to trading account. It is possible to do that. We don't worry about that. But it's not wrong if you had to do that. There are um, places that will use that method. So that is what your purchases account will look like. You can see you've got your ins on the debit side as you spend money from cash or credit buying your inventory. And the credit side is going to be where inventory was not an expense. So you're reducing your expense over here. The owner took goods, you donated goods, you sent it back to creditors. Okay. Um, either during the year, you would just use creditors control, or if you've got an allowances account, you would close that off at the end, and you would, you would close the entire purchases account off to the trading account. Any questions there? Okay. Carriage on purchases is now a new account that we're going to use in this system. Do you remember that if you paid for delivery of stock in the perpetual system, you added it to your trading stock account? Do you remember that? You treat it as part of the trading stock account because you said, if I buy t-shirts for 20 rand each and it costs me 10 rand per t-shirt to get them here, my actual cost is 30 rand per t-shirt and you need to factor that in. So we just added it to the trading stock account and we said the value of those t-shirts are now 30 rand because we've given place value to them. In the same way, we're going to need to take into account the delivery. However, because we are tracking opening stock, purchases, closing stock, 
we can also track our carriage as a separate expense. It will also form part of our cost of sales. It will also get closed off to trading stock. But if you've got carriage on purchases, if you've got customs or import duties, all of those costs that increase the value of goods, we will keep them as separate expense accounts, but they will also get closed off to the trading account. Okay. So, it also is going to form cost of sales, and that's what they look like. So instead of going straight into the trading stock account as we did before, we're not going to put it into purchases, because purchases is only my actual inventory that I bought, but I have my carriage and my customs duties that I will take into account as well. Any questions? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. When you close up an account, it means you want to have nothing left over. So it's whatever I had there, I send off on this side. I close it off. Yeah. Right. So your credits and allowances. Remember, I said this is an optional account. This is the return of stock. Only if you are sending back inventory, not anything else, just the stock. Okay? You could put it into this account or you could put it into purchases if you don't want to have an allowances account. And then you will close it off to the purchases as you saw in the previous tier account, like that. So you notice here again, closing off, I've got my um, entries over here on the credit side of creditors' allowances because I'm wanting to decrease my expense. And it goes into purchases. It's the same amount. Right. So when I'm recording stuff in my journals, I'm going to use the same journals as before, but it actually gets a little bit simpler. I don't need to worry about recording my cost of sales all the time. So I'm going to just have no cost of sales account. In my cash payments journal and my creditors journal, I've simply got purchases and carriage on purchases instead of trading stock. So you're just changing the names. But keep in mind that you are using these expense accounts instead of my trading stock asset account. Your creditors allowances journal will have a creditors allowances column or a purchases column, depending on the system you've chosen, instead of inventory. Okay, instead of trading stock. So your internal stock control, it's quite important to keep in mind that in the periodic inventory system, your control needs to be a little bit tighter because your accounting records are not going to tell you how much stock you are supposed to have. So you're going to have to get clever and manage your stock in other ways. However, please guys, keep in mind, you can't say to me, oh, the perpetual inventory system is, has got better control because your books tell you how much you've got. They don't. You might have recorded, even if you had recorded everything that went out that you sold. If something got stolen along the way, if you just look at your accounting records, you don't know something's been stolen. But if you go and do a stock tank and you compare it to your accounting records, that's when you know that something might have been stolen along the way. That's when you're worried about it. Okay. So be very careful how you phrase your answers here. So it's very important to have good stock control no matter which system you're using. You need to keep accurate stock records. Obviously, in the perpetual system, your stock records will be more accurate because you are tracking your stock continuously. You need to do a physical stock take to be able then to compare what is actually happening, what do we expect it to be, what is it actually. In the periodic system, it's harder because we don't necessarily know what it should be. But we can sometimes work out using calculations having a rough idea of what you thought your markup was, therefore what do you expect it to be. Okay. So your stock movement records should work in such a way that you are able to prevent fraud. You need to track your stock, so you won't necessarily do it in your accounting records, but you might have stock records that tell you, oh, but we sent this much stock from here to there, so that you know where the stock is at any point in time. You can also link your stock records to identify the actual quantity, the old stock you might have, stock losses, etc. You want to identify what's going on. So you want to be as specific as possible in your actual stock calculations, your stock take sheets, all of those kinds of things. Obviously, 
obviously this is easier with Mitchell because your accounting records are also reflected, but you can get stricter with your periodic as well. So you require better physical control with your periodic information. Right, I want you please to do exercise 6.3. It's a very short, easy exercise just to see if you've understood all this theory that I've bombarded into.